Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, mammals. Didn't plan on having to post this video, but as I was sitting in on Lou's deconstruction yesterday, I noticed something that made me go, oh crap. Um, if you recall, the AP College Board offers uh, curriculums for all of its classes that are divided into units and they're put out there for maybe new teachers to give them support to how to how to teach it. Um, I don't really use it, not so much because it's not a good order, but because it doesn't work for you guys because most of you haven't had regular chemistry first. And so they just decided, oh, we're going to lop off the last two units, you know, because of this whole COVID-19 thing and... You know, that'll make up for not having regular classes during the very end of the course. Well, that's fine and dandy for the people that, you know, were following that. Not so much for us because, you know, they lopped off Unit 8, which is acid base, which we spent a month and a half on, uh, which now we're not really directly tested on. The other thing in Unit 9 that got lopped off is Electrochem. And so I think, oh, okay, no electrochem. Well, that's cool. I haven't taught electrochem yet. Uh, but while Lou is doing this thing and he's going over what's in the other units, buried in unit four is oxidation numbers, which I hadn't talked about because I teach them with electrochem. And so I just hadn't thought about that. But they're in unit four, so they're fair game. So I'm going to give you a quick primer on it. Um, I'm not too stressed because I don't think this would be more than one point on this exam, but as you saw, you know, one point on a 20 point exam can be important. So I'm going to try and, and help you guys get after that should it show up. Um, I'll start off by talking about the difference between oxidation number versus formal charge. I had mentioned them when I did the video on formal charges and resonance structure. So it'll be good review on formal charges. And they're very, very similar. Um, you can also calculate them without seeing a Lewis dot structure and can be a little bit faster. So we'll talk about how to do that. And then we'll talk about what a, quote, redox reaction is. And that'll be good review because it will give me an opportunity to talk about net ionic equations. So... This isn't all lost and gives me an opportunity to uh, touch on some things. And on the redox reactions, I'll do something that I consider fair to balance uh, and something that I would consider unfair to balance, but who knows what's going to happen. So we'll cover that too. So oxidation numbers are very, very similar to formal charge. So I made like one of those like product comparison checklists to show you how much is the same for like the free free app versus the paid for app. Uh, and they're very, very similar. Um, they have slightly different purposes. We looked at formal charges in order to evaluate Lewis structures and see which one is the best Lewis structure because it has the lowest number of formal charges, possibly even zero formal charges for everything. Um, oxidation numbers, on the other hand, are to determine if electrons have been transferred in a reaction. And it also can be a strategy for balancing reactions that would be very difficult to balance otherwise. When you're calculating these, you start off with the number of valence electrons. That's true for both. You subtract from an atom the number of lone pairs that it has. That's true for both. Where they get different is what you do with the bonding electrons. In formal charge, you subtract half the bonding electrons. It basically works out to subtracting the number of bonds because a bond's made of two electrons, and we're treating this as a perfectly covalent bond where they're perfectly sharing, and each of them get half the electrons. So... If there's a bond, you subtract one of the electrons for each of the atoms in the bond. Oxidation number, on the other hand, treats it as a perfectly ionic bond, where the more electronegative atom gets all of the atoms in the bond, or all of the electrons in the bond. So that's 
kind of a frame that you can think about this. Here, they're sharing, so they each get half of the ones in the bonds. Here, they're not sharing. We're treating even covalent structures. We're kind of pretending that they're ionic bonds to see where the electrons would go. Now, don't, don't say that it's an ionic bond because it's not. This is just, these are two methods to model where the electrons are at. One method where we're modeling them as perfectly covalent bonds, one method where we're modeling them as ionic bonds. And again, that's probably dangerous territory to actually write. I'm just saying this is a, a framework for how do, you, how do you think about what these are doing that's differently. And then in the end, the formal charge and the oxidation number should both sum to the overall charge if it has one. So I've got some Lewis dot structures here, and we'll use these rules to compare the formal charge to the oxidation number real quick. To make it visual, I'm going to do the formal charge in blue and the oxidation numbers in red. So formal charge, this oxygen has six valence electrons. Subtract four lone pairs and subtract two for the bonds because there are four, four electrons here and we're getting half of it. That gets me a formal charge of zero. And that, of course, is going to be the same for this guy because he's identical. For the carbon, I have four valence electrons, minus zero lone pairs, minus four from bonds, gets me zero. So this is, you know, the best case for a formal charge, the easiest, most valid Lewis dot structure when everything's zero. That's what you're looking for when determining a Lewis, uh, a Lewis dot structure with formal charges. Oxidation number, on the other hand, we're going to treat these bonds like they're perfectly ionic and give all the electrons to the more electronegative atom, which is the oxygen. So here, six valence electrons, that's the same, minus four lone pairs, that's the same. The only difference now is it gets all of the electrons in the bonds because it's the more electronegative atom, and in case you forgot, the closer you are to fluorine, the more electronegative you are, if you need to decide that. So it has an oxidation number of negative two. You're going to see that most often, formal charge and oxidation number don't agree with each other, and that's okay. The carbon is going to be four minus no lone pairs minus none, because it gets none of the electrons in these because it's the less electronegative. And so it gets a oxidation number of plus four. This is going to sum to zero because this oxygen is also negative two. It's the same as this guy. And so there's no charge here. So we should have no overall formal charge or oxidation number. Formal charges are all zero. So of course it sums to zero, negative two, plus four, negative two, sums to zero. Let's look at our good friend ozone. You've probably seen enough of this guy now if you've done the mock exam, watched my deconstruction video, and watched Lou's deconstruction video. You've seen enough of ozone. Okay, we've got three oxygens here. They're all different, so we're gonna to have to compute the formal charge and oxidation number of all of them. So starting off here, six minus four lone pairs, minus half the ones in bonds, zero. Six minus two lone pairs, minus half the ones in bonds, positive one. Six minus six lone pairs, minus one bond, negative one. Everything's different, everything's still sums to zero, which it needs to because this has no charge. Oxidation number. Six minus four. Hmm. How do I divvy these up? These are identical atoms. So they're equally electronegative. 
So in this case, it's going to be the same as the formal charge because since they are equally electronegative, we're going to split the electrons equally between them. So this is going to turn into exactly the same math as the formal charge. So if you have something that is bonded with itself, then you treat it like formal charge and you split them equally since they're equally electronegative. And that's going to lead to one of the rules about elements that we'll get to in a second. Okay. Nitrogen, 5, minus 2 in lone pairs, minus the bonds, gets me 0. 5 minus no lone pairs minus 4 bonds gets me positive 1. 6 minus 6 lone pairs minus 1 bond gets me negative 1, sums to 0. Formal charge, 5 minus 2 minus Again, half, because we are in an identical bond here, so this guy gets half, so that's going to be the same for the formal charge. Minus 3 equals 0. This middle nitrogen, on the other hand, it's going to get half of these, but it's not going to get any of these, because oxygen is more electronegative. So in this case, it's going to deviate a bit. So 5 minus no lone pairs minus 3. Positive 2. For the oxygen, 6 minus 6 lone pairs minus, it gets all of these, negative 2. And sums to 0. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is that the oxidation number and the formal charge do not have to agree with each other. Let's get to our rules. Okay, if you don't have a Lewis dot structure, you could of course draw the Lewis dot structure and um, get it, which is fine. Uh, but here's some handy things. I would write these down somewhere on your paper so that you can you can refer to them if you need to calculate a oxidation number this way. You know, maybe, you know, add these too. So you're prepared for whether a question asks you for formal charge or oxidation number. So as we talked about earlier on the ozone one, when you've got the oxidation number of something bonded with itself, we treat it sort of like a formal charge because they're equally electronegative. This means for pure elements in their normal condition, their oxidation state is zero. If it's an ion, its oxidation state is going to be its charge because oxidation state is treating it like it's an ion. For things that aren't elements and aren't ions, here are a couple things that are going to get you probably in a problem all but one thing. Fluorine, being the most electronegative element, is always going to get all of the atoms in a bond. So it is going to be negative 1 in all compounds. I said except for F2 because in F2 it's an element. And if you want to think about that, if we drew it, you would have seven valence electrons minus six lone pairs. And since it's bonded with itself, it's going to get half of these electrons because one fluorine is not more electronegative than the other. Voila, zero. Oxygen is negative two for most things, except for, I made a mistake here, not you. That's an element, but it's not its standard state, except for 
O2, where it's an element, and it's zero, and we'll look at hydrogen peroxide here. We'll do the Lewis dot structure for that. So I'm only going to do one of these oxygens because the other one would be the same. Six valence electrons minus four lone pairs minus, for the bonds, it gets all of these because it's more electronegative than hydrogen. So it gets two there and it gets half of the one with itself because it's equally electronegative. So minus three. So that gives it a minus one. And this works out to be an overall charge of zero because each of the oxygens get a negative one charge and the hydrogen gets a positive one charge. So kind of a quick way to solve if you were asked to find the oxidation number of something is to remember these. And then hydrogen, it's going to be plus one with nonmetals because the nonmetal is going to be more, more electronegative. And it's going to be minus one with a metal because it's going to be more electronegative if it's with a metal. So we'll do a couple practice problems here. Typically the way these work out on the AP is they give you one thing that isn't fluorine, oxygen, or hydrogen and then you have to solve because you remember the rules for fluorine, oxygen, and hydrogen. So again, like I said, we've got one thing, the nitrogen, that isn't fluorine, oxygen, or hydrogen. So we will be solving for that using our rules for the other. We know that the oxygen is negative two, and the hydrogen is with nonmetals, so our rule says that it's plus one. And now we're just going to you know, figure this out. The one thing that you have to take care of is that there are three oxygens. So I have, from my oxygens, I have three times a negative two. So that gets me negative six. I've got one hydrogen that is a positive one. So that's a positive one. And I have one nitrogen that is X. And this sums to, this is a neutral compound, so all of this sums to zero. So quick math tells me that the nitrogen must be positive five. This is the kind of oxidation number problems if you were asked to identify the oxidation number that I would expect. Let's do uh, another one here. Ars the arsenate ion. Okay. I have three oxygens times a negative two, so that gets me a negative six. I have one arsenic times X, because I don't know what it is, and that is summing to a negative three. So that means my arsenic must be plus three. This is oxalic acid. I had a kind of fun thing that came up with this. Some, someone was posting a, a video from, or a picture from his garden. He's gotten into gardening during this whole COVID thing. And he was like, what's this plant? And it was a plant called wood sorrel, which is in the genus oxalis. And it gets its name from, yeah, I'm a plant nerd too. Um, it gets its name from the fact that it has large amounts of oxalic acid. Uh, it gives wood sorrel kind of a nice like lemony taste. Um, things with lots of oxalic acid in them can be dangerous to eat large quantities of because it binds irreversibly to calcium. Um, if you've ever noticed like you've eaten a spinach salad, has to be spinach, um, and like the surface of your teeth feel kind of weird, uh, it's because spinach is also high in oxalic acid and the oxalate ion is binding to the calcium in your teeth um, and it makes that surface feel weird. Um, oxalate can also then bind to calcium down in your kidney tract 
and lead to kidney stones. So it's, it's no fun there. You've got to keep your, your pH properly balanced so it stays in the um, oxalic acid form and not in the oxalate ion. Um, so you want to keep this guy protonated, definitely. Anyway, tangent, let's use our rules. So I know that I have four oxygens times a negative two. That gets me negative eight. I have two hydrogens. It's with nonmetals, so it's going to be plus one. So that gets me a positive two. And I have two carbons times x. All of this sums to zero. So that means the carbon must be positive three. So if you remember these rules, this is just kind of some simple algebra to figure out whatever the oxidation number on the missing thing is. So uh, long story short, write these rules down somewhere on a piece of paper so you have them and label them oxidation numbers so you know to look at them. Okay, Let's talk about redox reactions, what these oxidation numbers are for. Redox stands for reduction oxidation. A reduction, give me some free space here, a reduction is when the oxidation number goes down. No surprise. Oxidation is when the oxidation number goes up. It gets this name because if you haven't guessed, uh, the most common element that's going to be involved in redox reactions is oxygen. And it always has a negative two. So when something reacts with oxygen, the oxygen becomes negative two. And that means the other thing must go up. Um, since the oxygen is becoming negative, the other thing must become positive. And a redox reaction is just simply any reaction where the oxidation number changes. I've seen past AP questions where they show you a reaction and they ask, justify whether this is a redox reaction or not. If it's a redox reaction, you would only need to find one thing and show that its oxidation number changed between the reactants and products. And it's pretty much everything is a redox reaction except double displacement and acid-base reactions. And this is where I can work in uh, some review on net ionic equations. Here's our old friend, uh, the precipitation of lead iodide. And this is a displacement reaction because lead was... Um, having nitrate as its counter ion, and then it's having iodine as its counter ion. If we split this up into all of its um, should say spectator ions, this is the only guy that's a solid, we would write this as PB. Nitrate has a negative one charge, and there were two of them. So that means the PB must be plus two to counterbalance that. Potassium, two of those. It's an alkali metal, so it's plus one. Two iodines. They're a halogen, so they're a minus one. Produces PBI2. That's a solid. I'm going to leave that together. Plus... two potassiums plus two nitrates. I'm going to cancel out my spectators. Nitrate, nitrate, potassium, potassium. So the only thing that's really involved here is the lead and the iodine. And there's nothing here that would have changed this, um, the oxidation state in this. There's still two iodines binding with the lead because the lead has a positive two charge and the iodine has a negative one charge. It's an ionic compound. So their oxidation numbers have not changed 
and this is therefore not a redox. Students are generally pretty good with saying that because everything is an ion, everything in this is an ionic compound. They can find the charges and see that none of them have changed, and they're good with that. Sometimes they get messed up with acid base because we might make a water, which is not an ionic compound. So let's think about this. If I drew this in net ionic form, you know, these are all aqueous, and then water's a liquid. So if I split them up, strong acid, so I split it, strong base, so I split it, soluble, so I split it, and water. I'm going to find my spectators. My spectators are just the chlorine and the salt because they could have been the counter ions to any strong acid and any strong base. And really the only reaction that occurred was H plus and OH minus forming water. So students might n not see that this is not changing the oxidation numbers because they see charges here and they don't see charges here. But if you follow our rules for water, hydrogen is going to have an oxidation number of one, positive one, because one valence electron minus no lone pairs and minus none in the bonds, because it's not the more electronegative, Oxygen, six valence electrons minus four lone pairs minus, minus four because it's more electronegative, so it gets all of them in the bonds, negative two. And that would be the same. The oxygen is still a negative two here, and the hydrogens are positive one. It hasn't changed. So if it's a double displacement or an acid base, it's going to not be an oxidation, uh, a redox reaction. Let's look at two examples for redox reactions and we'll bring this to an end. So this one is very obviously a redox reaction because I can look, I have copper 2 plus, so oxidation state plus 2, copper as an element, not as an ion, here it is as an element, the solid, and the oxidation state of an element is zero. And then the same for the aluminum, zero and plus three. You might look at this and say, oh, well, this is balanced. I have one copper, one copper, one aluminum, one aluminum, but it's not balanced because things also have to be balanced with their charges. And so we split this, since this is a redox reaction, into the reduction Copper 2 is going to copper. It's getting reduced. And the oxidation. Aluminum is going up to aluminum 3 plus. It's getting oxidized. And then these are called half reactions because I have the reduction half and I have the oxidation half. What we need to do now is we can balance these charges out by adding electrons. Two electrons would cancel the positive two charge, making it neutral. And here, I would need to add three electrons to cancel out the positive three charge. And now we just need to be able to add these two reactions, sort of Hess's Law style, to get our overall reaction. But electrons are not allowed to show up in the final reaction. So I need to multiply these so that my electrons cancel out. This reaction obviously I'm going to have to multiply it by 3 so that I get 6 electrons. And this reaction, I'm going to have to multiply it by 2 so I get 6 electrons. So if I distribute these out, I will get 3 coppers plus 6 electrons. 3 copper 2 plus plus 6 electrons goes to 3 coppers. 
to aluminum goes to 2 aluminum 3 plus plus 6 electrons. And now if I add these together, my electrons cancel out. And I get an overall balanced reaction. 3 coppers plus 3 copper 2 plus plus 2 aluminum goes to 3 copper solids plus 2 aluminum 3 pluses. Now we're still balanced with respect to our elements. 3 coppers, 3 coppers, 2 aluminums, 2 aluminums. But our charge is also now balanced. 6 plus, 6 plus. So that's kind of the extra step. This is what I would think would be fair and typical for an AP um, redox reaction. Let me show you one that's not typical, just to cover all of my bases, and we'll, uh, we'll call it a day. So this is a real bear uh, to balance. I can recognize that it's a redox reaction because of the nitrogens. That would be kind of what I clue into first. I would see here that the nitrogen is with, uh, that's going to be negative 4 plus 1. So in this case, the, oxy the nitrogen is a positive 3 oxidation state. And here I have negative 6 from the oxygen, and I want to leave one, so it's going to be a positive five. So if asked to justify whether something is a redox reaction, that's as far as you would need to go. Find one thing that has its oxidation state changed. So I'm going to split this into my oxidation and reduction. I've already spotted that the nitrogen is getting oxidized. That means the chromium in the other must be getting reduced. So this is my oxidation, and the compounds involving nitrogen are going to be in my reduction. Well, this still looks really ugly and doesn't get me any closer to balancing this, because we've got all of these oxygens involved. And here we've got two chromiums, and over here we've only got one chromium. So I want to fix that first, fix my chromiums, and now deal with my oxygens. I have seven oxygens here, and I fix that by adding seven waters. And Mr. Edwards, that's still not fixing it, because now you've introduced 14 hydrogens. True. These are normally done in acidic conditions. So I fix my hydrogens by adding H pluses, protons from acid. And then the last thing that I check is my charge. And I'll fix that by adding electrons, since a redox reaction is transferring electrons. On this side, I have a grand total of positive 12. I have two negative here and 14 plus from the hydrogens. On this side, I have a grand total of positive 6. I have two 3 pluses. So I need to bring this side down from positive 12 to positive 6 by adding 6 electrons. So I'll rewrite this all nice and neat, and this would be a balanced half reaction. I'm going to repeat this same process with the nitrogens. Okay, my nitrogens are balanced, so I don't have to do that. Next, check my oxygens. Adjust oxygens by adding waters. Now I have three oxygens on both sides. This side has three hydrogens. 
So add three H pluses. Balance my charge by adding electrons. This side is negative or neutral. This side has a positive two. So I need to add two electrons to make it neutral also. Uh, warning bells should go off in your head if you add electrons to the same side as up here because we want the electrons to be on opposite sides of the reaction arrow so we can cancel them out. We'll do the same thing that we did in what I considered the fair example is cancel out my electrons. Here I have six electrons, here I have two, so that means, means I need to multiply this reaction by three. So three, three, three. This becomes nine, and this becomes six. And I'm gonna rewrite that underneath this one here so we can sort of Hess's Law sum it and get our final answer. 3HNO2 plus 3 waters goes to 3NO3s plus 9H plus plus 6 electrons. And now I want to start canceling. We did it so that the electrons could cancel. So I'm going to get rid of those first. We've got waters on both sides. I have three waters here and seven waters here. So this becomes four. I have nine H pluses here and 14. So this becomes five H plus. And now everything should sum up to get my final answer. Cr2, O7, 2 minus, plus 3 NO2s, plus 5 H plus, goes to 2 Cr3 plus, plus 3 NO3 minus plus four waters running out of room. And that's that. I'm really sorry about this. I would have posted this earlier um, had I noticed it and would have included it in our final review. But I, I don't suspect that you will have to do this. So I wouldn't stress too much on that one although I find it oddly therapeutic to go through this process, de-stressing for me. Um, this one I, I could foresee, they give you this and they ask you to balance it, and the key thing that you're looking for there is you must not only balance the elements, but the charges have to be balanced. I can imagine them asking you to justify whether a reaction is a redox or not, and you just need to find at least one thing that has its oxidation number changed. And you can find the oxidation number either by remembering these rules or by calculating it from the Lewis dot structure. So I'll leave that there. Um, as always, take care of yourself and others, practice good hygiene, and I'll see you on the flip side.